Hey folks, I'm Otto the Rocks, and I am taking a brand new dive into making videos. Uh, I'm a developer designer that's currently working on the TypeScript team at Microsoft. My work tends to range from like package managers to programming languages, and it sort of really encapsulates this idea of like how do you describe and compose complex developer tools. And one of those developer tools that like almost every developer uses nowadays is Git. And I think to kind of understand why Git is sort of used everywhere and why it is actually a really good tool, we kind of have to understand the entire history of Git. And so that is what this video is gonna teach you. And we're gonna say why Git was made. So Git is sort of the end of a long lineage of version control system. And I think in order to understand what Git is, we need to kind of understand the sort of stages of, of version control systems that got us to where we are today. Um, in part because I kind of believe that Git is sort of the end state of version control systems. In, in part, it reminds me a lot of like the QWERTY keyboard, right? The QWERTY keyboard is not the greatest keyboard layout. There are, you know, the French have a Xerti, which is very close, but not the same. And there are people that use Vorac or other, other interesting keyboard layout systems. And, you know, it's great, it's got its uses, but uh, at the end of the day, pretty much everybody uh, is using a quality keyboard. And uh, I think Git is basically gonna be the same at this point. Like its market reach is so, so out there that like, you know, it would, it would take such a massive shift in how developers build things to actually change Git being like the dominant way in which we do source control. So Git describes itself as an open source, decentralized version control system that kind of represents your code as a tree of changes over time. Um, this tree is kind of interesting and we'll touch on it a little bit, but if you're interested in, in how that's built, it's called a Merkle tree. Um, and uh, it basically means that you can sort of verify all of the sort of information above you in a tree cheaply, <laughs> um, which is very useful when you're changing branches or doing commits and things like that, um, which is why Git is considered a fast uh, version control system. And if you've never used any of the other ones, then you won't know what it's compared to. But believe me, they used to be very slow. Um, so <laughs> looking through the generations of version control systems, we have like back in the 1970s, there was sort of two major ones. There was one called SCSS and one called RCSS. And these were like fast, but not very smart. Uh, you know, they were effectively like another folder on your, um, on, on your hard drive. I guess in the 70s, it probably was a literal uh, like hard drive. Um, and you would, it would just take a copies, put it over there, and you could have like a sort of command line interface that would ask questions about, you know, what version of this file was at the time. Um, the sort of second set that came out like 20-ish years later in the 1990s um, was sort of CVS and Subversion and Perforce. And these were solid tools. I got started with CVS and then I migrated to Subversion and then I migrated to Git. Um, and you know, these have these these are all centralized version control systems. So CVS has this conceptual idea not of like every single change only being on one file. Uh, so you know, you would check you you take a copy of your entire uh, source code and you'd sort of request one file to diff at the time and you'd send it back up and like you'd hope that nobody else was making changes and pushing them at the same time. Um, Subversion was like the first one that said, hey, why don't we sort of clump all these changes together and call that thing a diff? So, you know, you could change abc.txt as well as def.txt and ship them both in the same conceptual diff. Um, and those those were like those were good for the time. Like they they were they were considerably better than uh, SCSS and RCSS, and they were open source, which was good stuff. Um, and then around like 2004, 2005, and six, that's when we started to see like the whole game start changing because you had the Bitkeeper and Darks and Monotone. These were like three solid version control systems that all had an interesting idea. So Bitkeeper acted a little bit like Subversion where it would deal with these changes as chunks and that made it much easier to sort of work with. Darks had a similar setup. And then Monotone was the first one to introduce a directed acyclic graph. These are called DAGs normally. And they effectively 
say, um, well, you've probably seen one already. If you've ever gone on to github.com um, or used a visual Git client and you've seen these like la- like sort of arrows, that look like subway charts, right? Where it forks off, it goes down and then it connects back in. Those are uh, directed async lit graphs, um, are just visualized. Uh, and they they work with the concept of Merkle trees to do really cool stuff. Um, but, the, but monotone is interesting because it's like, unlike almost everyone else, its backend is just... It's just a SQLite database. <laughs> Every now and again, I, I find this a, a really compelling idea of just like your, your file type is actually just a, a, a fancy wrapper around a SQLite database. A lot of iOS apps do that with a thing called Call Data too. Um, and that was sort of stage 2.5. And then from that, there was this, uh, there was a, an event, uh, effectively. A, a large amount of people were using um, BitKeeper, uh, which is a closed source, uh, closed source version control system that, that uh, they changed their licensing system. And uh, I think it annoyed a large amount of uh, like high profile open source developers uh, that were using this in their, for, their, for their work like the Linux kernel or for like Ubuntu. Um, and they suddenly find themselves on, on uh, at a point where they can't control the sort of software that they use to make the software that they, that they, that they make their lives, uh, that they're living on. And so we got this interesting period where Git came out, Mercurial came out, Fossil came out, and Bazaar came out. And it was like this time period where like you just hear a new sort of conceptual way of doing uh, version control. And like it was hard to differentiate the differences. And it's a little bit easier now that they've all sort of settled. Um, but like it was not obvious that Git was going to be the one out. So let's try and think a little bit about why it was Git that won out. So back then, um, like with quite a lot of us, it was free and it was open source. So Microsoft had their own thing that was called Source Safe that was pretty cool. There was BitKeeper, which I mentioned earlier, sort of the progenitor of all this generation. And there's Perforce, which is a very like big enterprise-y um, sort of version control system that's really well suited for projects that have large amounts of assets and not sort of source code files. Like if you think that a source code file is generally, um, you know, let's call it 2000 lines of code long. That's like a 30 kilobyte file and differing and manipulating those is pretty trivial. But if you're like, you know, doing games dev, the files that you're working with will be like megabytes to gigabytes big. Can you imagine how big like, you know, uh, let's let's say an Unreal 4 game engine map is in terms of just like gigabytes, may- maybe even terabytes, like it could be reasonable. Um, and so you need a different kind of version control system than the sort of one that we're used to uh, in with like, in terms of normal, normal developers dealing with small source files. Okay, so one of the interesting things around this set of tools is that like all of them are decentralized. And this all comes from like this pain point of the idea that um, you know they used to all work with this central server, and now uh, and and they revoked the permission for free for open source developers, uh, and and now all these different teams of people are starting to build their own version control system. So you know Git, Mercurial, Fossil, Bazaar, all of these are decentralized, and what that really means is that like you don't sort of have just a a copy of it. You have a full clone on your computer. So conceptually, everything that's in GitHub or GitLab is conceptually also available on your computer. That's what makes it fast for, you know, doing like Git checkouts or looking at a diff or looking at a specific uh, like change set. Like all of those things are like available on your computer and are not, you don't need to like make an API call. Um, You know, for my first, when I first used Subversion and CVS, like in order to see the diff of a file, it kind of had to check every single file hasn't changed, see when the last change was compared that to the last changes on the server and then send down a diff of the differences between the two. So even just looking at a diff took multiple API calls and was like a slow process to even do. Now you have a full copy on your computer of every single bit of information that Git would actually want to use on its, uh, to show you the information that you'd like to know. 
Um, and what this meant was that conceptually it was de decentralized. Um, and, you know, I imagine the highbrow idea at the time was that we would all be running our own Git servers and they'd sort of talk to each other. I know that in my life, probably like two or three times I've ever used like two folders both talking to each other through the official sort of Git uh, sort of cloning system. Um, but almost all of us <laughs> basically centralized on these centralized services like GitHub or GitLab that um, host our, our Git repos for us. But we kind of get the, the concept of forking from that, right? Like, you know, if I if I fork TypeScript, the repo, um, then I have auto slash TypeScript and that it has all of the information that, you know, Microsoft slash TypeScript had at the time, but it's all available entirely on my personal like fork of it. And then on top of that, if I have a copy of that uh, available on my computer, then there is like at least three full copies of all of the information at that time. And that represents all of the branches, all of the changes, all of the sort of the code at the end of the day. And being able to have all like all of the access at all times is a very powerful tool that has allowed Git to have like a pretty complex set of features. Um, and on top of that, it's done it fast. And that's what's really cool. Git is extremely fast in comparison to the older generation before it. And you know, so is Fossil, so is Mercurial, and so is Bizarre. In fact, um, you know, within these set of siblings, like honestly, it's just, it's hard to differentiate them uh, without like going into very small like differences. So like, here's an example, this, <laughs> here <laughs> is how to clone a repo on Git and how to commit. This here is how to do the same thing, but for Mercurial, like they're basically the same. All of the like, you know, the terminal commands do almost the exact same thing, have almost the exact same metaphors. Um, and, you know, the differences between them, like, you know, people say that Mercurial had a better user interface, so, you know, better error messages, better ways to handle merge conflicts. But like, <laughs> you know, Mercurial did not have GitHub and that alone is probably one of the major reasons why Git ended up winning out in that case. Fossil, in my opinion, is one of the interesting ones because like one thing that's hard to get when you're just starting programming and it may still be for quite a lot of folks is that like Git in the GitHub bit is only like the files that are sort of, you know, the communications back and forth. Like things like concepts like pull requests or GitHub issues or the wiki, um, uh, all these things that wrap around it that sort of is a GitHub value add, those don't exist in Git. Um, but in Fossil, they do. And so Fossil tries to represent like bug reports and wikis all inside the actual sort of uh, database of, um, of changes that, that, that these tools do. Um, and that's a pretty cool concept. Honestly, I, I thought that that might have been one of the reasons why it could have won. But again, like you couldn't account for GitHub existing back then. And you know, that's kind of why, why Git won in the end. It's, it's like a, a very very, very trivial answer. Um, so Git grew out of like this desire to have a decentralized open source version control system that could you know be everything that they needed for the Linux uh, kernel. And you know, to my knowledge, I think it was roughly at, built in a month, and then you know has been built for I don't know twenty ish years since then. Um, and some of the features that I think are sort of like standouts to, to Git nowadays that would be very hard to replicate easily is like Git submodules, you know, like the idea of having multiple Git repos in a single Git repo. Like, you know, I built <laughs> repos with like five, I built, I built one that was four Git submodules deep. Like it was, uh, it was like a, a, a GUI client. So I worked on the Mac GUI that then had an objective C library that had a, uh, a C++ wrapper that then had a C library and all of those things were nested Git submodules. So like you had to make, make a change to one of them. You had to like do this cascading system. Um, they built Git LFS. I think that was sponsored by GitHub maybe um, to sort of look at the problem of how do you address large files in a Git, uh, Git repo. Um, and there's like Git subtree. How do I clone only a specific amount of the, uh, the, the Git repo and shallow clone? How do I make sure that I only 
clone like a, a, a depth layer so i only basically get like the the files rather than the full history um for something like uh the cocopod spec repo that that's kind of useful like the cocopod specs repo is like a Imagine a package manager where every bit of information about the package was actually available on your computer. They're making it like somewhat decentralized. Um, that process was done via Git and every single diff <laughs> was in the history. And so it's a very, very big history. Uh, and now, now we've fixed that problem, but we, we kept it that way for about seven or eight years. Um, and nowadays there's been some work on trying to fix like the sort of user interface of Git. Like, you know, we think of the user interface as sort of, you know, the, the terminal commands that you use and the metaphors that you think about how you use for source control. Um, I'm, I, I, I tend to use Git checkout a lot. So like Git checkout dash B to create a new branch, Git checkout branch name to jump between branches. But Git is trying to like uh, add new metaphors into the sort of, uh, uh, the tools that you use. So there's now Git switch and Git restore. These are meant to be like tools for helping you creating new, um, and, you know, jumping between branches and things like that. Um, and the, there's a lot of work done on the moment done to sort of make it easier to use for new folks. Cause like Git's one of those things where you're like, yeah, you, you, you could probably memorize maybe 10 commands and you're probably going to be okay with just that for like a good few years. Uh, and then suddenly someone asks you to bisect a, 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 you know, a bug that was like two years ago on a version that uh, doesn't compile on modern soft, um, uh, you know, modern tools. Uh, that's when you're going to need to learn all your Git foo. Um, also, like Git as a conceptual system is quite small and simple. Uh, it's a lot of files in, in dot folders effectively. Uh, you can go look at them. Um, and so I've seen multiple implementations of Git in different languages. So there's a uh, you know, for Danger in Ruby, yeah, in Danger Ruby, we actually do use a Git implementation built in Ruby to, uh, to sort of, you know, pull out the history, try and find out where all the, the changed files are and do stuff like that. Um, and I know that there's been an implementation in JavaScript, and I'm pretty sure there's a really good tutorial that teaches you how to build your own implementation of Ruby. Uh, of, not of Ruby, of Git in Ruby. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about how all that stuff works, uh, you can find it. It's all, it's, people are out there doing really cool stuff. So if you want to sort of dive deeper into like why, what Git is and why it works together, um, you should obviously visit their homepage. There's a good book by Scott Chacon. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Ch Chacon? Mm, I don't know. Um, but uh, that's, that's good. That, I think it's called Learn Git. Um, then there is the... Um, you should look into direct acyclic graphs and Merkle trees, especially if you're like interested in blockchain. Like uh, the Merkle tree concept is used in blockchain to verify the entire history of the um, of the, the ledger, the blockchain ledger. Um, and it's the same conceptual like tool as used in, in Git history to be sure that like the changes come after the, the changes. Um, and so you can learn a little bit about that on the internet, <laughs> shocking. Um, and you can, I think probably the best resource I found for m me understanding like Git uh, is a thing by Tom Presto Werner called um, the Git Parable. And it's like a, it's just a, it's just a you know, it's just a non-technical-ish explanation of how each stages of version control system came about uh, and how they were all like sort of logical steps on top of each other to eventually become like decentralized, direct, you know, DAGs. Um, and that's a really cool read. So I'd recommend reading that if there's anything to come out of this. Um, uh, that's the end of this. So that means I have to tell you to like and subscribe. Uh, I also have to tell you to leave a comment. So the prompt for leaving a comment comment is what is your worst merge conflict i think mine uh tended to always come from using xcode xcode had these massive xml files that were represented your project state and you know one person edited one file at the top of the file and another one somewhere else and like you just ended up learning how to sort of delete things inside and delete merge conflicts in a, in a in an xml file really quickly as an ios developer um, they were particularly bad in storyboards too. So uh, that was my merge conflict nightmare. I'm sure there are better ones. Uh, all right. Ciao, folks. It was a pleasure. Have a good time.